What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. Jermaine's Nicholas, big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. As always, every Wednesday we're coming back with a new video. If you miss Monday's video, we had in the muck. We're always comparing two players on Monday. Kareem Hunt versus Dalvin Cook was this week's. Um, go check that out if you missed it. Today, we are jumping into my top bounce back players slash post hype sleepers. So dudes that um, maybe got too much hype, disappointed, and now people are drafting them a little bit too late for where they should be going. They're going undervalued because of the recency bias that always happens in fantasy football. They had a down year or they were overvalued and now you can get them for steals in your draft or guys that just have a lot of upside still um, given the position that they're in. So we're going to talk about my top three bounce back post hype sleeper guys today and uh, I'm going to try to do this whole thing in one take because I don't feel like editing this shit. And that's it. So I'll see you all in a second. Now, before I get into the video, I want to let you guys know that the draft guide update, the newest one, because I put those out every single week, will be dropping today at 3 p.m. You'll be getting an email letting you know what was new in the draft guide. If you guys are new to the channel, I have my 2018 Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football draft guide. It's pretty much your one-stop shop for anything you need to prep for your fantasy football draft. You can catch it at BigDogsFantasy.com. It's got my top 250 rankings my positional rankings by tier, my must draft players, my top sleepers, my top busts, all my favorite resources and websites to help you throughout the fantasy football season, my Bible, which is like 8,000 words going position by position, how you should attack your fantasy football draft. This year, uh, you can go check it out again on bigdogsfantasy.com. There are reviews up on the site from people that have purchased it already, hearing a lot of positive feedback. And this is updated weekly throughout the summer, every Wednesday, I will hit you with emails on the new updates. This is completely virtual, online, e-magazine that you can access through your tablet, through your phone, through your laptop. Mwah. It's some good stuff. So go uh, go cop that if you have not already. And I appreciate the support for everyone that has already purchased that thing. So um, also, if you are going to purchase it, you get a follow-up email within a few minutes of purchasing it. That should give you instructions on how to grab it. If you don't see that email, then check your spam folder. If, uh, if you still don't see it, then you can hit me with an email, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com, and I'd be happy to send you over the instructions manually. Um, but let's let's get into the the actual content in this video so I can convince you to go buy my draft kit because I know my stuff. Number one bounce back player, post-hype sleeper is Randall Cobb. Um, and I think this was an obvious one for a lot of people, but when I dove into this player and when I really got more and more into the stats, I was like, dude, Randall Cobb, is even more valuable than I assumed he was going to be in 2018. I was like, you know, he's an easy post-type sleeper, like someone who's going to be giving value. And I had a lot of question marks in my head. Like, still, I don't really know if I trust the Green Bay uh, coaching staff to do the right thing or if I trust that Randall Cobb is still the player he once was or whatever. But now he's getting picked 101 overall, wide receiver 40. And I think his, his ADP, as videos like this and as other hype pieces continually come out throughout the summer, his ADP will probably keep rising. But as long as he's anywhere within like the first 80, even 70 picks, you're getting really, really, really solid value on him, um, according to what I'm about to kind of get into for you guys. Um, for those of you that you know read the reports that he was in a walking boot, he's already out of it, completely healed 100%. It was a very minor thing that he was dealing with. Um, those things are very soft, the walking boots, so they're just very... Uh, they're a precaution for the most part. But again, he's out of it. He's good. Um, and, you know, training camp starts within, depending on when I film this video, it starts within a few days or when you watch this video. So he, he'll be all systems go for training camp. For one thing, Cobb is relatively still young. I know he, it feels like he's been around forever, but he's only 27 years old. Um, 20, 2018 will be his eighth year in the league, all with the Packer, Packers. Now, Green Bay had a decision to make this offseason, right? Go uh, move on with Jordy Nelson or Randall Cobb, pretty much. They'd have to pay one of them. Um, and they decided to keep Randall Cobb over Jordy Nelson for whatever reason. You know, um, it might have been because they saw that Jordy Nelson completely fell off or the fact that they saw that Randall Cobb was still a good player and they wanted to keep him in this offense. I mean, listen, I get it. Cobb is not the receiver he used to be. Uh, and many people are still kind of holding on to that rope of like recapturing the 2014. Randall Cobb season where he caught like, let me see what it was, like 91 passes, 1,287 yards, 12 touchdowns, was wide receiver six in fantasy. It will not happen. 
but you have to look at the 2018 Cobb as a completely different player and a completely different fantasy player than the 2014 Cobb. And that's what we're here to do today. I talked about it a few times that I really think that this Green Bay wide receiver core will be an open competition this summer, considering they took players in the fourth, fifth, and sixth round. Uh, they have Geronimo Allison there, who's young and has gotten a lot of hype, but it's only because he's had a couple big games here and there. I don't think he's like a complete wide receiver by any means, but you know, there's a lot of a lot of names there, um, and there's going to be an open competition, I think, at least for the wide receiver two, probably three role. Um, but for right now, Cobb is the clear-cut wide receiver, too, in this offense. He's been around. He's proven it with Rodgers. He has great chemistry with Rodgers, right? He knows the playbook like the back of his hand. Coaching staff is very comfortable with him. So he will have the wide receiver, two role unless something goes awry. And for some reason, you know, he plays his way out of it, which I don't expect. And, you know, when you're in an Aaron Rodgers offense, it's really hard to mess shit up, right? You have to run a lot of wrong routes, which is something he doesn't do. You have to forget the playbook or not know the playbook, which is something he doesn't he, it, which is something he obviously knows already, right? Being there for so long. Because Aaron Rodgers is so accurate. Like, unless you're just dropping passes left and right or messing shit, shit up that other people would know, it's like a mental thing, you're going to be fine. You're not going to lose your spot because Aaron Rodgers is delivering you the ball and you're going to look good regardless. So I'm going to hit you with a few charts, a few self-made, self-marinated charts up in the headquarters that will probably turn you into a Cobb fan by the end of it. Number one, and you've probably seen this before if you follow me on Instagram, I might have put it in one of my other videos. You can see here, these are the numbers for the average wide receiver two uh, finish in Green Bay since Aaron Rodgers took over as the starter in 2008. You'll see it's missing a couple seasons, uh, 2013 and obviously last year because he, was, he missed the majority of both seasons due to injury. So we just took all the other years that he was the starter. And as you can see, the averages of the wide receiver two here, about 105 targets, 70 receptions, just under 1,000 receiving yards, and eight tutties. If he is the wide receiver two in this offense, those numbers, would that would that surprise you at all? If Randall Cobb opens season as wide receiver two, he goes 70 for 991 and eight touchdowns. I don't think that would surprise anyone at all. If you're in this offense, you're going to have a very, 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 very good opportunity to score touchdowns, regardless of how good of a wide receiver you are, because they get there often with Aaron Rodgers leading them, and they throw a ton in the red zone. And Cobb was bad last year, but he wasn't even as close to as bad as people might think once you actually dive into you know what happens there. And you look at his numbers when Aaron Rodgers played, man. So this is what I had to do. Uh, and I think the I, I think what happens for a lot of an, um, fantasy analysts, or at least this summer, you're seeing the splits that Cobb and Rodgers played last year. And what they don't discount, and this happens to a lot of players who are coming off an injury, is they don't discount the games in which, like, I'll show you the example of what I'm talking about with Cobb and Rodgers. So Rodgers played in seven games last year. Randall Cobb was not active for one of them. So they were active on the field. They started together in six games. Uh, one of those games, Rodgers came off the field after completing just two passes is when he broke his collarbone. So you're looking at a five-game sample of when they actually played fully together in five games, right? A lot of times, if you just go to like a Rotoviz Game Splits app, you're gonna get seven. You're gonna get six because it, it, all it says is that they've appeared in these games together. You don't discount the game where Rodgers came out after two passes. So. They actually played in five full games together last year. I went back and manually got the numbers and averaged them out for you guys. So in Cobb's per game numbers in those five games, he got nine targets, six catches, 62.4 receiving yards, and .4 touchdowns. When you pace those out to 16 games, you are looking at 144 targets, 96 receptions, 998 yards, 6.4 touchdowns, or Wide receiver 13 last year in half-point PPR, fantasy football. Ridiculously good numbers. So that tells me when Aaron Rodgers is on the field and Randall Cobb is on the field, when they're playing together for full games, guys, Randall Cobb was still the fantasy player that we thought he once was, that we done thought he once was. But the best part about me diving into this is what I found from an actual like physical player standpoint. Cobb didn't fall off last year as a player. He won't be the 2014 Cobb, but he was much better in 17 than he was in 15 and 16, actually. Um, and that's taking information from multiple sources. I wanted to look at Matt Harmon's reception perception. He stated that Cobb was the biggest surprise in a good way when he graded out receivers this summer. He stated that his 2017 reception perception numbers were much closer to the 2014 breakout season than 2015 or 2016. He had a 71% success rate versus man coverage. He hadn't cracked 60% in either of the previous two seasons prior to 2017. 
He also had an 82% success rate versus zone coverage. Those were both, both versus press and man coverage and success versus zone coverage, both top 10 among the wide receivers that Matt Harmon graded in his reception perception. You look at uh, playerprofiler.com, Cobb's 2.03 yards of separation per target. So his separation, his separation skills from defenders were uh, 11th in the NFL last year among wide receivers. And his game speed data tracked by Josh Hermsmeyer on airyards.com, go check that out, very good source, was actually a huge increase from 2016 to 2017. So I don't know if it was injuries in 2016 or why he wasn't playing up to speed, but his 2017 numbers looked maybe a little bit worse, but almost comparable to 2014 numbers from a physical standpoint. Like I said, he's just 27 years old. He's still a guy that can move with the ball in his hands, you know, as good slot receivers need to be able to do because their average depth of throws are always very short. They need to make their own plays on their own. Among 54 wide receivers last year in the NFL that saw 70 or more targets, so there's 54 that had 70 or more targets last year, Cobb ranked third in the NFL in yards after catch. So, he could still move, he could still catch, he could still run routes, he's still doing his ting, he did not fall off, he just needs Aaron Rodgers' backs. He needs Aaron Rodgers' bike. The last thing I like here, you'll look at this chart, um, this is kind of just in general with Aaron Rodgers returning, is that Cobb's volume in the red zone, red zone should go back up. Cobb only scored four times last year, but that's not really that bad considering he only saw two, uh, six red zone targets and three 10 zone targets. Now, when you look at the targets that he did see, right? I went back and I looked at those six red zone targets and the three 10 zone targets. You could actually look at where they came from in pro football reference. Rodgers only played those first five weeks, right? And Cobb missed one of those games. So Cobb saw three of his six red zone targets in the first month of the season. So he was heavily involved in the red zone when Rodgers was actually under center and he was giving him those valuable passes, right? His, uh, his last red zone target came on September 28th, which was still the first month of the season, which was their week four game versus the Bears. And then Hundley took over after that. He didn't see another red zone look until fucking week 11 against Baltimore. Green Bay went from a team that passed the ball in the red zone 67% of the time while Aaron Rodgers was under center uh, and a league high 71% of the time in neutral game scripts. And that number dropped all the way down to 55%. So you're seeing a 16% drop off in 2017. So with Rodgers back under center, there's no doubt in my mind that the number will increase back into at least the 60s for a percentile, um, probably around 65%. And it has historically been that way. And we can see by the chart I previously showed, or that's on the screen right now, Cobb was a guy that was used in the red zone plenty when Aaron Rodgers was under center. And he was used in the beginning of the season when Rodgers was, was under center. Excuse him, why? As soon as Hundley went under center, though, he stopped utilizing Cobb in the red zone. So I don't necessarily know that I'm banking on a monster bounce back here for Cobb, but you should expect some wide receiver two realistic Green Bay Packer wide receiver numbers under Aaron Rodgers. But I can guarantee you he's going to return value where he's being picked. If he's going to be going over pick 100, he's going to re be returning great value for um, for where he's being picked. And again, my only caveat is the fact that I do think it's going to be an open competition in Green Bay for the wide receiver role. I think that's more probably for the wide receiver three role because Cobb is almost, I mean, you look at the other wide receivers, right? You look at Jerron Wileson, you look at Jamon Moore, um, those guys, they're not built to be really like slot receivers. Cobb is the only one that's like prototype slot guy. So I think he's safe in that realm. I think we're going to see a nice bounce back for him. Numero dos, my second bounce back post type sleeper is... Another wide receiver, another NFC wide receiver of the Seattle Seahawks, Tyler Lockett. 157 overall, wide receiver 58. We had somewhat of a breakout rookie year back in 2015. He caught 51 passes, 664 yards, eight total tutties, one kick return, one punt return, and six receiving touchdowns. That's how he totaled the eight. So an absolutely explosive playmaker when he was on the field. Lockett has kind of failed to step forward in either of the 2016 or 2017 seasons, largely in part due to like a plethora of, yeah, y'all didn't think I had that in my vocabulary, a plethora of injuries. Shout out Asher Roth for that one. He dealt with a lot of injuries, right? He had a quad strain. He had a fractured fibula and tibia. He has dealt with knee soreness, just all these lower leg injuries that have really slowed him down. Um, and when you have a guy like Lockett, right, who excels because of his explosiveness, he runs a 4-4-40, which is elite speed at the NFL level. Um, he's ridiculously explosive. So when you have leg issues, that's going to hamper your ability to create plays and really be an on-field presence, right? So Lockett is a guy like Devontae Parker. Um, shout out Devontae Parker. Next week's In the Muck Monday video, Devontae Parker versus 
Jameson Crowder, baby. So stay tuned for Monday, who is year over year disappointed after coming out that in that draft class. A lot of hype, uh, a lot of fantasy recognition, thinking that they're going to break out. Hasn't happened yet um, for one reason or another. We just were addicted to these guys. We're addicted to them between Crowder, Parker, and, and Tyler Lockett. We're, it's like crack, man. We can't. The, the itch needs to be summoned, right? We're always chasing that high. We're chasing that breakout year. And I think, I don't necessarily know if Tyler Lockett's going to have a monster breakout year, but he's in a great opportunity to return value where he's being picked. For one, Lockett has been a boomer bust guy, mainly because he can never see the volume. But thankfully for 2018, we I think the situation changes a little bit, right? Jimmy Graham and Paul Richardson are both gone. They both found new homes, Jimmy Graham in Green Bay, Paul Richardson with the Washington Redskins. So there's some serious targets up for grabs. That exact number would be 172 targets, along with, per Evan Silva's uh, Seattle team outlook article on Roto World, which I highly suggest you guys check out all of his team outlooks. Uh, they are unaccounted for 2,098 air yards, the sixth most per any NFL team entering the 2018 season. The great part for both Lockett and Doug Baldwin, both guys who I love to have good bounce back years in 2018, uh, is that these uh, Jimmy Graham and Paul Richardson leaving is opening up a wide variety of targets, right? It's not just one player leaving and a bunch of targets opens up, whereas like Jarvis Landry leaves, right? And those are a lot of slot, young, like over the middle targets. Those aren't all going to go to Devonta Parker, right? Because those aren't the types of routes he runs. But between Paul Richardson and between Jimmy Graham, that leaves a lot of the short over the mi middle kind of targets that Jimmy Graham got, a ton of red zone and end zone targets which Jimmy Graham got, but it also leaves a lot of deep shots down the field, uh, playmaking throws from Russell Wilson, which is what Paul Richardson saw a lot of. So it opens up a wide variety of volume for these guys to go make plays. And both of them are guys who could play down the field or run routes over the middle of the field. Graham led the entire NFL last year in red zone targets with 26. He led the NFL in red zone touchdowns with 10 and 10 zone targets with 16. Graham led the NFL in all three of those categories. Between the two of them, Graham and Richardson, there are 37 red zone targets and 21 10 zone targets opening up, along with, I think, over 50% of Russell Wilson's passing touchdowns. So the signing of Brandon Marshall doesn't worry me at all. We just had a report come. I wrote this thing before the report even came out that he didn't worry me at all. But now they're saying he's not even a lock to make the, the roster, which I'm not surprised by at all. He's still going to be a guy that's used in the red zone if he makes the team, but that's all about that's about all he can get. He's like he, he's almost like a poor man's Des Bryant at this at this point. He's not going to be able to create a lot of separation. He still has strong hands. He can still make plays in the end zone when called upon to do so, but he won't make an impact between the twenties. I can promise you that. So this works out great for Lockett too, um, who is who I mentioned is like a lid lifter, right? And that can he can now capitalize on on the volume that Paul Richardson leaves behind, who operated as a deep threat last year while Lockett was pretty much banged up. Now, Paul Richardson led the team with an average depth of throw of 15.4, 16 yards per reception. That 15.4, 16.0 yards per reception. That 15.4 average depth of target was sixth highest in the NFL. All wide receivers that had at least 80 targets, which was 49 of them. So he was a legit deep threat in the NFL last year. We've seen the explosiveness from Lockett as long as he's healthy. And according to Pete Carroll, as of June 7th, which was oh, like a month and a half ago, Lockett is back to 100%. Those are the reports, and he looks good. Even last year, he actually ranked 15th among all NFL wide receivers in target separation per player profile. This was Tyler Lockett. So even banged up last year, he was still separating from defenders with pretty pretty much, you know, like with ease. Uh, so that's something I, I, I see continuing into 2018. I just think Lockett is, is capable of, of a year that like John Brown had back in 2015, where he had uh, like 65 receptions, a thousand yards, seven touchdowns, right? And it's not necessarily like, I think Tyler Lockett's going to break out and be like Antonio Brown and, you know, start putting up 90 for 1,310 touchdowns. But if you're getting a guy like Tyler Lockett at pick, what was he? What was his ADP again? I forget what I said. 157 wide receiver 58 you're ba he's basically free in the drafts right and if you could put up a year like john brown had 65 for a thousand and seven that's incredible value that's guys that if you're at you know if you're in like a 12 or 14 or 16 team league those are guys at the end of your roster that you're really happy to get like you i don't know if you necessarily want to draft tyler lockett in a 10 team league but not everyone plays in those smaller leagues if you play in a deeper league these are guys that help you you know win on uh, some weeks and those are huge because each week um, really matters. And then you look at the Seahawks defense, man. They lost everybody, man. They went from the Legion of Boom to the Legion of Whom. 
Now we see Cam Chancellor's not playing. We have Earl Thomas is looking to get traded to the Cow or the Raiders or the Cowboys or whatever. He wants to be out of Seattle unless they're given an extension. I don't know if that's going to happen. They don't have Richard Sherman anymore. Um, Cliff Averill's gone. Sheldon Richardson is in Minnesota. Deshaun Sheed is in Detroit. Michael Bennett is in Philly. <sighs> Zam. When you say that out loud, that's a lot of missing pieces there. So um, as much as they want to establish the run in Seattle, I don't know if their defense is going to let them. They're not going to have a lot of heavy games, good game scripts for, for the run game. So I see Tyler Lockett kind of being utilized pretty heavily in the passing game as Russell Wilson might have to attempt a lot, a lot of pass attempts in 2018. So that's why I like Tyler Lockett. And before we move on to numero tree, post hype sleepers, bounce bike players, I'd like to thank the sponsor for today's video, Fantasy Jocks. Use promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P, to take 10% off your order. Guys, they are the industry leader in championship belts, championship rings, championship trophies, and live draft boards for any fantasy league, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, it don't matter. They got it all down packed for you at fantasyjocks.com. This stuff is very, 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 very high quality. I promise you, just have everyone chip in an extra eight. Eleven four dollars to get what you want. You can get the team's names engraved on it year over year, so you know who won the chip. Wearing this bad boy around every Sunday while you're watching football make you feel pretty damn good about life. They actually hooked me up with a, an awesome belt for my E Town Get Down League, completely customized. If you guys follow me on Instagram, my personal Instagram, or or my my fantasy football Instagram, you probably saw me at the uh, at the party. You know, wear my overalls that I wore for the Golden Tape versus Marvin Jones video. The uh, the the smoking meat and clapping cheeks party was this previous Saturday. Great party. I'm editing up the clips right now. I brought my camera, so I'm gonna vlog that whole party, and uh, I'm getting back into the vlogs again. So. Stay tuned for that. Anyways, yeah, I had that belt there. I had to give it to the champion that day. Uh, but I just want to thank the sponsors for today's video, FantasyJocks.com, the industry leader, the number one rated, the FSTA award-winning best championship belts, trophies, rings in la business for fantasy sports. FantasyJocks.com, take 10 or Taco Corp. I got y'all. Whew. Man's about to pass out. I got to stop doing... got to start doing more cardio. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch that sentence up for you to keep it PG, parental guidance, baby. Number three, let's go. My boy, out in the dirty, dirty, Matthew, Matty Ice, Matt Ryan for the Atlanta Falcons. Currently being picked as quarterback 16 in fantasy, 115 overall. I think what's gonna happen is with Jared Goff now, right? Uh, Jared Goff had that you know the the step forward season last year. Um, finished as, I don't know, like quarterback 12. And now he's getting picked within like the top 10 quarterbacks for fantasy. He's going to disappoint pretty greatly. And then next year he's going to be picked as like quarterback 19 or quarterback 20 or something. And then he's going to be a great value there, right? You don't hate the player, you hate the ADP. These things are easy to see. Anyways, again, we're talking about Matt Ryan. He had that prolific year in 2016, the MVP season with Kyle Shanahan. 4,944 passing yards, 38 touchdowns. Then he flopped like LeBron in 2017. His completion percentage dipped by more than 5%. His yardage total dropped all the way down to 4095, which is about 900 yards less than he had the year prior. And his touchdown total, listen to this, went from 38 down to 20 last year. 18 touchdowns is going to, that's more than one full touchdown per game. Despite finishing as QB 14 overall last year, he had just four weeks finishing inside the position's top 12. He topped 300 passing yards, which is not difficult to do in today's game. Um, four times in, out of 16 games. And the worst part about last year was he finished the season throwing for one or fewer touchdowns in 11 of 16 games. And Matt Ryan was definitely one of those guys where you're like, oh, I'm going to give it one more week. I'm going to give it one more week. This is going to be the week. Good matchup, blah, blah, blah. He sells Julio and all these weapons and just kept disappointing. One or fewer touchdowns in 11 of 16 games. So you look at those 2016 numbers, and not only were they amazing, but the 2017 numbers were actually far below his career averages, right? So it's not only like, did he perform so well that you knew he was gonna regress in 2016, but now he performed bad enough that you know he's going to be much better in 2018. So we look at his statistical categories. 64.7% completion percentage was his lowest since 2011. His yardage was the lowest since 2010, and his touchdown total was his lowest since his rookie year in 2008. These will progress back to the means, guys. And when you look at Ryan, outside of just like, him, you know, his numbers and stuff, just look at him as a quarterback. 
He still performed fine in 2017 by almost all measures. So he was the seventh best quarterback per Football Outsiders and their DVOA metric. His adjusted completion percentage per PFF was actually third in the NFL, despite the completion percentage in a vacuum being very low. His adjusted percentage per PFF was third in the NFL for quarterbacks. He was um, fourth per player profiler. And overall, he graded out tied with Drew Brees as PFF's second best quarterback overall for a grading system in 2017 behind only Tom Brady. He was in front of Carson Wentz, in front of Russell Wilson. So Matt Ryan, despite the numbers dipping and despite all this happening, was actually a lot better than uh, th- than people think he was. And his numbers should show, that that's like predictive statistics. Those are predictive numbers that should tell you that there's going to be a bounce back in 2018. Um, the numbers just didn't show up because they didn't score the ball. The offense ranked second in the NFL in yards per drive, second in plays per drive, first in time of possession per drive. But they had fun, f- trouble finishing those drives, people. They ranked 15th in the NFL in scoring, only 22.1 points per game, which doesn't make sense if you're getting the second most yards per drive in the NFL among teams, but you're 15th in scoring. Something doesn't add up there. Their red zone scoring did not work last year, and you could only expect an increase back to the mean for 2018. In 2016, obviously, was their second year under Kyle Shanahan. He made the offense explode. But their first year under Kyle Shanahan, they only scored 21.2 points per game. So their first year under Sarkeesian, they actually scored more points than their first year under Kyle Shanahan. They scored 22.1 as compared to 21.2 under Kyle Shanahan. And I do not think that uh, Sarkeesian is anywhere near the offensive line that Kyle Shanahan is. And I'm not expecting them to make that jump from 22 to 35 points again. But... Uh, it's saying just don't automatically write this offense off because Sarkeesian's there. Give them time. A lot We see a lot of teams need to adjust the second year in a new system under a new offensive coordinator and stuff. So I expect them to take a step forward for, from that sense as well. Uh, the scoring dip was not only in the red zone, like the red zone numbers, but it was Matt Ryan's touchdown percentage as a total, right? His total percentage of attempts that went for touchdowns. So his touchdown rate. He threw a touchdown on just 3.8% of his passes in 2017, a number that he actually led the NFL in during his uh, MVP season at 7.1%. Now, that number, as I said before, is an outlier too. But prior to the 2017 season, his career average, if you discount his rookie season, has been over 4.8%. Last year, it was 3.8%. If he's even at his average last season, right, at 4.8%, his touchdown total goes from 20 to 26, and he's a top 10 fantasy quarterback easily. And since 2010, Matt Ryan has averaged 29.4 touchdowns per season. 29.4 passing touchdowns a season, discounting last year, if if you take away last year's numbers. Still uh, at 28 if you include last year's numbers. I think we're going to see a season that's much closer to his averages that he's had since like 2010 than what we saw last year. 2017, 2016 was an up year. 2017 was a down year. I expect that to hit back in the means and him produce, you know, those 28 touchdowns that he is been um been pacing towards basically his entire career so uh, i really like to draft matt ryan as one of my later round quarterbacks someone that you can get at quarterback 16 you just have to consider this offense on a personnel level on just on paper they have probably top three rosters in the nfl all the peepers uh, pieces uh, are on paper to see them succeed and now they add calvin ridley with their first round pick another field stretcher another guy who has great routes it's another weapon for matt ryan to use so it's um, Calvin Ridley, Julio, Muhammad Sanu, Devonta Freeman, Tevin Cole, all these pieces. They have the third ranked offensive line per PFF. Uh, just a really, there's nothing, no downside to this offense. So if Matt Ryan is going to bounce back, it's going to be in a big way in 2018. I just think recency bias is keeping him from um, being drafted in the top 12 or top 10. And he's much, much more likely to finish in the top 10 than outside of the top 16 where he's currently being drafted. So That wraps up the three guys that I like to have bounce back years or post type sleepers. I do have some honorable mentions um, that I would put in this video, but I don't like to recycle guys and recycle players that I've mentioned in videos a lot because each video I do, I I go pretty damn in depth on a certain player. So if I do them in one video, I don't want to do them again because it's going to be pretty much the exact same analysis I had in the prior video. That's the only downfall of going really in depth is that you just it's hard to add new stats every time you do it. But I would have Emmanuel Sanders for sure as one of my bounce back players. Devonta Freeman, um, Amari Cooper. I don't necessarily love Amari Cooper as an actual player right now. I think he's a little overhyped, uh, but the volume is going to be there. So him, I have Calvin Benjamin, Kinti Inunua, Ty Montgomery, Isaiah Crowell, I know is going to be a popular pick. Devonta Parker, Jameson Crowder, Josh Doxson, all guys that I think are a little bit post-hype sleeperish in 2018. But three guys I listed are the guys that I think are most likely to do it outside of these guys who I've already talked about. But um, that's going to be it. If you enjoyed the video, please give that thumbs up. 
and subscribe to the channel if you're new. We do videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I actually think I have a video dropping for you guys tomorrow as well because it was a podcast I was featured on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Sunday, if you want to be notified when the live stream drops, you just got to hit the little notification bell under the video and you will get a notification letting you know when I log on. It's usually between 1 and 2 p.m. Eastern time on Sundays, depending on how hungover I am. Which should be, oh, actually, I don't know if I'm going to make it this Sunday because I'm leaving for a wedding in Orlando tomorrow. I'll be there Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'm going to be out late as shit Saturday night. And I don't, oh, man, I'm the worst, bro. I definitely, so it's my friend's wedding, my friend from college's wedding this weekend. He's doing it, he's, he's getting married in a Disney resort, which I can't wait to, I can't wait to get down there. It's going to be mad fun. A bunch of my college friends. The wedding Saturday night. I'm pretty sure my flight home on Sunday morning is at like 8 a.m. I don't know why I did that. I might, I'm probably not even going to end up sleeping that night. <laughs> Why was I even saying that? Oh, actually, I mean, I guess I will be in, back in time for the live stream, but if I'm alive, I'll try. Otherwise, I might have to skip this week, fellas. I apologize. Um, maybe I'll do it on, like, Monday night instead. I don't know. Let me know what you guys want me to do. So, that's it for the video. Again, subscribe, thumbs up, all that good shit. Go buy my draft guide. I'm done. I'm tired. Goodbye.